like configuration here. So again, internal configuration, it has to be only 1.5 to 2 millimeters anterior when you, you have to dip and enter. I'm sorry. You have to dip and enter, and your edges also have to be very smooth. Uh, and when you dip and enter, I, you should not have saw-like movements, you know. When you go up and down, then you're going to definitely cause ragged edges internally. And at the limbal region, it's going to be very tough. So you have to enter slightly uh, anterior to the limbal region. So uh, the length of the wound is uh, directly proportional. Uh, I mean, it's uh, three times proportional to the astigmatism. So that is why we spoke about the cord length and the arc length. So this is the imaginary tunnel that we were uh, discussing about. So again, suture, when you place it, don't shy away and uh, don't you know refuse to put a suture. When needed, you always have to do it, especially when you have a complication or if you feel your wound integrity is not good, never shy away and uh, always make sure to close the uh, incision well. So when you have to place sutures, which is a rare thing, if your tunnel is good, your wound inte integrity is going to be maintained in SICS. When uh, you have to place it, always make sure that your sutures, one suture would usually suffice, but in case you've extended uh, beyond uh, you know, what you had planned initially, then in those cases, you might have to suture it. So when you suture uh, more than one suture, make sure the suture lengths are equidistant and uh, also the lengths are equal. That way you will not be inducing astigmatism. So here you see when your uh, length is more than the width, then you'll be inducing with the rule astigmatism. And again, when your sutures are widely placed, you're going to have against the rule astigmatism. And tight sutures will definitely cause with the rule astigmatism, or uh, depending on where your location is. Loose sutures, again, your sutures will not oppose properly, and it's not going to. Uh, so this is how the suture will cause an effect when it is too tight. So I think want of time. Uh, yeah, so in case you want to uh, post surgery, you want to correct a patient with astigmatism, obviously suture, you have to remove the suture at least two to three months post uh, uh, surgery and spectacle correction. Contact lens and uh, LASIK surgery is an option, but uh, I don't do it. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you, doctor, uh, for the wonderful uh, talk. Dibya, you have uh, opportunity for research. I think you should uh, give little time for this. The suture is becoming obsolete, sort of. Yeah. So no, I no, think but yeah, yeah. But when needed, it should really be used. So I will no, beg to differ no, from no, sir. No. It's not ob obsolete. Seat obsolete belt and parachute is needed we, sometimes. If, we, so. if you tell the students, they have that inhibition Doctor, that I might. Doctor, to Doctor Boramani, sir. Anyway, Boramani, sir. I will next time expect a research paper from you. Okay, thank you. No, you people are teachers, so some research is expected. Okay, thank you. Okay, our next speaker. Arthi. Yeah. Uh, our next speaker yeah. is Arthi. Our next speaker is Arthi Hada. She will be talking on Boramani's uh, customized SICS. And Dr. Arthi is a very young, dynamic leader with uh, numerous uh, roles to her credit. So, but she has been a great uh, pillar of strength in ISMS ICS. Please, ma'am. Thank you so much. So uh, taking the discussion forward, we have spoken about incisions, we have spoken about astigmatism. So um, we, I'll be talking on a very interesting topic. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Sahu and team AIOS for this wonderful opportunity. A big thank you to Dr. Boramani, sir, uh, for allowing me to present his topic of Dr. Boramani's customized incision cataract surgery. 
So as we all know, cataract surgery has now become a refractive surgery and the biggest concern with SICS is surgically induced astigmatism. So I'll start with a scenario. This patient with pre-op astigmatism of 0.13 diopter underwent a small incision cataract surgery. Post-operatively, patient had astigmatism of just 0.17 diopters. So is it possible to not induce any astigmatism with SICS? Let me show you another uh, case with pre-existing astigmatism of two diopters who happened to be a VIP and wanted to get implanted with autofocus pro lens, which is a multifocal lens without any rings. Presently, they don't have any toric uh, range of lenses. So other I also had astigmatism of two diopter and phacoemulsification was done elsewhere and patient had astigmatism of two diopters post-operatively. So we decided to do SICS for this eye with the aim of reducing the pre-existing astigmatism of two diopter. So patient underwent small incision cataract surgery and post-operatively patient had astigmatism of 0.43 diopters on topographer. Autoref showed the astigmatism of just 0.25 diopter and subjectively the patient was six by nine with plano glasses. Next. So the published literature shows that the biggest advantage of FACO over SICS is that the induced astigmatism is less, but there are no studies to say how SICS wound modification can lead to desirable results on astigmatism. The principle is very simple. A straight incision leads to astigmatism of 1.25 diopters to 1.5 diopters. When the incision is frowned, wherein the end of the incision goes away from the limbus, the astigmatism produced is 0.75 diopter, uh, indicating that the more curve the incision is, the less astigmatism it will induce. So this is how one can titrate the incision against the pre-existing astigmatism. So after doing many surgeries in last five to six years, Dr. Boramani says that a straight incision of 7 mm will induce astigmatism of 1.69 and it will keep on going uh, down as the size of the incision is reduced. So if the incision is frowned one, the induced astigmatism will be uh, just 0.5 diopter and as you go on making it more curved, it will induce less astigmatism. So if it is perfect U-shaped incision, it will not induce any astigmatism. The temporal incision are away from the optical axis so that they are not very strong in inducing or neutralizing the astigmatism. So a 7 mm temporal incision will induce astigmatism of one diopter and a 5 mm will induce astigmatism of just 0.4 diopter. Uh, if the temporal incisions are curved, then they have no effect on astigmatism. So superonasal and superotemporal incision behave in between the superior and the temporal incision. So accordingly, you, can, uh, you need to calculate. To have a better effect of, as of incision on a steep meridian, you must enter, uh, you must enter your incision on the steep meridian, irrespective of the shape and the size of the meridian, so that the vector forces are acting equally on both sides of the steep meridian. So the next question is where, where to sit for the surgery? Whatever uh, may be the steep meridian, you will always get this half circle on both sides, both uh, the sides. You can go inferotemporal or slightly superonasal. Operating from the nasal side may be difficult, but it's possible. But you can always fashion your incision on the steep axis. The SIA software can be useful to calculate your own astigmatism. You can put one type of incision in one meridian to find out your average astigmatism. So we will go through a few more cases. Uh, this patient had pre-op astigmatism of 0.28 and steep meridian is 100. So the incision was taken at 100 degrees and it was extremely curved. So there was hardly any change in the astigmatism. In this case, uh, the left eye was operated. The steep axis is at 40 degree. Uh, the incision was slightly curved, taken at superotemporal axis and it had hardly changed the astigmatism. This is another case of a multifocal IOL. 1.62 diopter of astigmatism has just become the astigmatism of 0 0.29. Uh, this is an interesting case with astigmatism of 3.5 diopter and the patient was not willing to go for a toric IOL due to financial reasons. A large straight incision was taken and there was a significant reduction in astigmatism and surgically induced astigmatism was almost uh, uh, three diopters. Her incision was almost 7.5 mm on the steep axis. 
So now we can stop calling it as surgically induced astigmatism and call it as surgically corrected astigmatism. And the technique should be called as customized incision cataract surgery. So thank you so much for your patience. Thank you. Boramani sir, would you want to give some comments? Meanwhile, uh, Dr. Nelutpara Devri from Shankar Deva Netralaya Assam. Only comment is you become master in SISAS with a large and comfortable incision. If you are comfortable in delivering any nucleus through any type of incision, then you start customizing your incisions. Long term, actually in private practice, it is very difficult. Many patients, they don't come back after one year. It's very difficult to assess. No, sir. Okay. Yes, Nilith Panna. No, 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 no discussion now, please. <laughs> yes, Nilith Panna. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm extremely honored, and uh, my gratitude to uh, Dr. Amale Sahu, sir, the entire team of ISMSCIS and AIOS for giving me this opportunity. So today I will be speaking about uh, what we call as Sahu's technique of advanced SICS, and I do not have any financial interest in this presentation. So my gratitude to sir and my mentor, Dr. Harsha, for giving me uh, the opportunity to work in his institute and learn from Sahu sir. I will not go into the, all these uh, techniques, but what I want to uh, tell you about this uh, modified technique is that uh, the, the modifications that have come up is either related to the incision, uh, as you have seen from all the previous lectures, and or to the delivery of the nucleus, whether you do a phaco fragmentation or take it out uh, in total. So the resultant high wound strength of the MSICS technique enable modifications in incision parameters to minimize surgically induced astigmatism and improve the refractive results. So the aim of uh, my study was to discuss the advanced technique uh, of two millimeter frown incision with 1.5 back cuts on either side, which is known as the Sahus technique. There has been more modifications to it by increasing the back cuts to around 2.5 to 3 millimeter. The primary objective being to investigate the pre- and post-operative effect of this technique on corneal morphometric parameters and also assess the influence of wound integrity, intraoperative complications, and the learning curve. So these are some of Dr. Sahu's modified instruments. We will discuss uh, in while I'm playing the video. This video is not playing. So uh, once the video starts playing, I would like to explain that we have taken a frown, two millimeter frown incision. Uh, uh, you can see the figure. We have taken two millimeter frown incision, just 1.5 or two millimeter behind the limbus. And then we have initiated the back cuts from either side of the frown. These uh, back cuts are then from here. Which one, which one you want to take? Yeah, this one, any, or you can, any, anyone. No, no, not this one. This is the little one coming. <coughs> not that. In the folder. Yeah, this one. Here? Yeah, yeah, this one. <laughs> yeah, so you have placed the frown inches and then you have initiated the back cuts. Now, when you are uh, doing the scleral dissection or making the pockets on either side, you have to be careful that you are on the same plane. Now, uh, the entry into the uh, corneal wound is six millimeter because I want to go ahead either with a foldable or a PMMA IOL. I'll tell you why PMMA IOL. Because if you uh, create the scleral pockets, it creates a compressible floor so that the nuclear fragments glides out easily. It uh, makes a trapezoid net type of an effect. So here I'm using SMV, South Modified Vectis, 
And on top of it, I am uh, giving the viscoelastic substance. And with the visco cannula, I'm breaking the nucleus into two fragments. Now you see, this is a 5.5 PMMA optic eye that I have inserted. How am I able to do this? I'm able to do this because the two millimeter back cuts, 2.5 millimeter back cuts that I have initiated, it increases the diagonal length to around five millimeter and the scleral elasticity gives uh, uh, space for me to put it inside. So for those who feel that they don't want to go with a four level, they can also go with a 5.5 uh, optic PMMA IOL also. Sorry. So I'll go back to the uh, presentation. I'm so sorry for this. So this is uh, the same problem. So you can also do a FACO fragmentation in the bag for taking out uh, the, gliding out the nucleus. This is another one. Then these are soft nucleus. So here, uh, Dr. Sah this is Dr. Sahu's video, where he is using the Khan's chopper to divide the nucleus in the bag and then uh, take it out into halves. So uh, when you are uh, encountering a soft nucleus, it is adv advisable that you use a flat instrument, for example, the iris spatula, to take the nucleus out of the bag. Do not use a cystitome or maybe a sin screw. So you can see it is easily gliding out. You can use the viscoelastic OVD and then glide it out of the, through the two millimeter incision. So again, going back. So the only thing was uh, left to us uh, to divide the nucleus in the bag and we are not doing dividing the nucleus in the bag. 90% of my cases I am dividing in the bag and she, is, she has taken one step forward. She is putting the PMMA lens and comparing now the results of uh, 2 millimeter with FECO. So these are so my uh, initial 51 cases that we had uh, that I had done uh, from the visual equity from the first post-operative day had improved the log of zero up to the sixth post-operative day. That is, these were some of the pertinent questions that you are, the audience has been asking. So this remains actually from six weeks to three months, it remains stable. The mean spherical equivalent of autoref measured estigmatic error changed marginally to 0.5 from 0.4. So you see in the uh, uh, biometry, you see the cylindrical uh, power with two millimeter where I did a two millimeter of 0 0.35. And you look at the topo, it is only 0.4 on the other hand, and this one is a six millimeter where the cylinder was only 0.5 and I induced it to 1.4. So the surgery induced difference of about half a diopter was achieved when a pairwise correlation was seen. So in another case, it was 0.7 and a two millimeter led, it led to an astigmatism of 0.0. .0. This is not even a autoref or a subjective refraction that I'm saying. This is a calculated refraction that I'm saying. So the endothelial cell count also, you look at the CV ratios on both sides, two millimeter, six millimeter. The CV is within the normal range of 37. The wound integrity, we looked at the wound integrity with the ASOCT. You can also use the UBM. You see that the interface is absolutely good. It is tight, compact, and there is no hiccups, no uh, interface problems in these patients. So definitely I had some intra and post-operative complications in these patients, and the most common uh, uh, intra-op complication that I had was iridolysis in two cases and post-op was corneal edema in six cases. Now why did it happen? It happened because I did not give the back cuts initially. I thought that I'll go ahead with the foldable IOL. The two millimeter entry, three millimeter uh, foldable injector, put it in. I forgot that if I am not giving the back cut, the compressible tunnel is not created. So where the nuclear fragments, when you are bringing it out, you are not a actually gliding it out, you are dragging it. And when you drag it towards the mouth of the funnel to engage it, it, uh, enga uh, it enhances the vector forces and uh, it directs towards the dome of the cornea, pulling the entire uh, central zone of the cornea towards the tunnel. So that what uh, made the problem. I had actually the video, I'll show you later on. So it does have a learning curve because it is an advanced technique, but you need to be perseverant, disciplined, and open-minded in your approach. 
In conclusion, I have been, this video is an ingenuity system that I did. Why I did this, I wanted to see that is it reproducible. Yes, definitely it is reproducible even if you do it in an ingenuity system, even after 51 initial cases. It is a refinement of incision. Dr. Sahu's technique is a refinement of incision. It uh, is safer for the corneal endothelium. And the wound architecture allows you to implant foldable as well as rigid PMMA IOL. It is cost effective and produces less carbon footprint. Thank you. The results thank are extremely gratifying. Thank you. And thank you once again. These are my references. Thank you, thank you. Thank you Dr. Nelut Parna. That was really thank great. You. Thank you, sir. Mm. So we are looking forward to the comparative uh, analysis between 2 millimeter SICS and uh, PECO. Wow. I hope it will come up. Great. We are, all of us are enthusiastically looking forward to it. Uh, we had missed Professor Deepak Mishra earlier. Uh, we know Dr. Deepak is a professor at the Banaras Hindu University's Medical College. He's a prolific uh, SICS surgeon who will be speaking on the journey of SICS from 10 millimeters to 2 millimeters. And in the AIOC, for last eight years, he has been the backbone of the SSTC, the Surgical Skill Transfer Course with Dr. Satanshu Mathur. And of course, he will tell us that FACO and SICS both are very, very popular and SICS still remains popular in SSTC after so many years. Thank you, sir, for nice introduction. But I still, what the audit we got from the last uh, six years, and there is almost the actual number, both cases are same. The residents' choice for SICS and FACO is almost same. Whatever we market is different that FACO is the preferred choice or not. For residency trading, SICS is still predominates over the FACO. With these notes, I will start my presentation. It is nothing but what the stalwarts sitting on the dais or in the auditorium, what they did. I am just going a brief about them, how our teachers and masters led this type of innovation that from initial 10 mm or 8 mm incision, we are now in a position that we can do SICS with 2 mm of incision tool. There is no financial disclosure. Why there is shift from ICC to ECC, just a introductory method, because we always want something smaller. Here is the one thing where we want smaller. In life, we want everything big. But in SICS is the only platform or the gift from the Indian tradition to word that you go for a smaller and be satisfied with what you have. So with this thought, we are moving day and day with some smaller demand. At least we can say our society and we can go for something smaller thing. And these goals changing time with time. So ECC wa ICC was uh, initially done just to prevent the blindness, but quality of vision was not much important or not given so much important at that time. Then ECC <coughs> has evolved into the life of the cataract journey and it comes to the improvement in the quality and some, but residual astigmatism is, is still there. Then we have SICS, either we say small incision surgery or the name given by Sausar, scleral incision cataract surgery, where we can slightly go for the maintenance and uh, reduce the astigmatism too. And now we are moving in a such a condition that we are now reducing this, our own incision and site day by day. These are the all the surgical construction and limbers. Dr. Nilutpara just explained each and every point, so I am skipping this. But for what we are reducing, the size is important, and that is most important because we are usually afraid or what the marketing is done that in SICS astigmatism is more than the FACO. So whatever the changes and drawbacks for us as from the tradition, we are now dispersing it and now there are many studies and uh, innovators like Buramani sir has already did lot of, lot of experiment on it, how to reduce the astigmatism in SICS. So these are the typical incision sites and what type of incision we find out and how the wound gap is being created. And with this knowledge, we reduce it day by day. And there are the various types of corneal incision also given by the different masters to reduce the size. This is a typical traditional SICS, but we are doing with 
six to eight mm of size, and with this, the nucleus management is important because as when we reduce the size of the scleral, how you deliver the nucleus, that is a most important challenge to us, and one of the important technique where we can remove this big nucleus by small is by the snare technique. Another one here you can see because with the help of the snare, it is almost phaco fractured. Half of the lens is removed first and half of the lens is removed second. So whatever the nucleus size of 10 to 12 mm, it is just reduced to six, so you easily we can remove it by six. Later on the phaco fracture, intra phaco, intra phaco fracture technique also occur where we bring the nucleus and pull it and rupture it half in the nucleus where the different stages and we can see that here after engaging nucleus in the tunnel we just compress it and remove the uh, part and rest of the part is been subsequently rotated and removed. With this Rawat sir also developed many techniques and he is the master person in the innovations in the science and in particular the SICS he developed a new technique where he can give some removed by the scleral incision of 6.5 to 7 and after that he developed his own software for to remove the pre-existing astigmatism. It is already published in IGO, anyone can assess and learn about his technique. And uh, last one, which is the point of discussion, 2 mm, Sahu sir already, sir's technique was told in detail by Nalutpara, I am not going in detail, but what is you have to maintain that always give some posterior incision too, as she said about what why she had some initial hiccup and that. And we are lucky that just two days before this article mm -hmm. has been published in IGO and now it is in market, that what is the post-operative astigmatism. And happy to share you all that whatever the two mm incision phaco fracture have good visual recovery as compared to the six mm or four mm. And we are already already doing multi-centric study on this uh, project of 2 mm, 4 mm and 6 mm. Hopefully in our annual conference we can give some more idea or get, uh, tell you what is the status after the, uh, seeing the statistical data. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I think uh, those of you who are interested in uh, small, very uh, two millimeter and uh, wound modulation, must market it as a premium surgery because then you have can charge more, you know. One of our friend is charging two lakhs, so at least charge at least one lakh. <laughs> because for surgery, this is, uh, those who have got the confidence and um, uh, have come to this level, you should not market yeah. it as a cheap surgery. Because the result is far better than phaco surgery, so you can charge uh, your whatever you want. Our next talk is very, very, very interesting. It's a new progressive IOL innovated by Dr. Jagdish Kakade and Dr. Ramesh Shah. Dr. Jagdish Kakade is going to talk about its science of the autofocus lenses. Uh, Jagdish, uh, 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 <laughs> the person who is standing, <laughs> person who is standing is a genius, you know. So listen to him very carefully. He has uh, developed so many machines and uh, so many that this new lens is by him only. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I am honored to present uh, this talk on the behalf of Dr. Amul Sahu, Dr. Buramani, and Dr. Ramesha. We all are together in this uh, uh, research, and we do have a financial interest. Uh, Autofocus Pro is an IOL which looks like monofocal but works like multifocal. It is an aspheric polyfocal intraocular lens with vertically progressive optic, just like the optic of your uh, spectacle lens. Uh, very focal spectacle lens without any diffractive rings. It is static and fixed in the bag. There is no mechanical pseudo accommodation and yet it gives you an accommodation of up to three and a half diopters. This is how it looks. It's almost, uh, you cannot perceive that it's a multifocal lens, but if you do an abrometry on oblique scan or on eye trace, you will notice the uh, progressiveness. Autofocus progressive uh, lens is, I mean, this is achieved by green technology, that is gradient refractive uh, index, so there is no loss of light energy like in the diffractive rings, and there are no photons which are lost. This is the schematic optic, upper half, uh, uh, upper 60 percent is for distance, then intermediate and then near, and here you can see that 
at any size of the pupil, the ratio of distribution of the light always uh, remains the same. And uh, these are the two dialing holes, which are also position indicators to be kept in the upper half of the eye. They also help to drain out the retro IOL visco. Because this is a vertically progressive lens, we have to orient it in horizontal position. And the two dialing holes has to be in the upper half towards the 12 o'clock position of the eyeball. And the serrated zigzag L-shaped uh, haptic, which are inspired from the postal stamp, uh, 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 they engage so well in the uh, fornix that there is almost an impossible rotation after the implantation. And its optic is unique. It's 7.5 millimeters horizontal, and it is 6.3 millimeters vertical. So it covers the entire field of vision without leaving any of the zone epicic and it does not give rise to the edge shadow on the nasal uh, retina, and hence it is completely free from the negative dyscotopsia as well. Let us see a short video of implantation of the Autofocus Pro. This is uh, designed by Mili Optics, manufactured by Lifeline. Uh, <coughs> please notice the two dialing holes and the zigzag outer edge of the haptics. It is a foldable lens made of hydrophobic material which is presented in water to prevent the glistenings. Zigzag outer edge of L-shaped haptic gives excellent stability. It's very easy to fold and easy to fold the haptic as well. It will need at least 2.6 millimeters uh, incision because it's large in size. So it won't go from incision less than 2.6. It's easy to insert the leading haptic as well as the trailing haptic into the bag. And uh, with Sinsky hook, we can dial the, the IOL. And when we dial, uh, the serrated edges of the haptic clean out the fornix base. And you can see that all the lens epithelial cells are scrapped out. And it comes out as a debris. And the two holes are to be kept in the position of 12 o'clock. <coughs> Once again, to repeat, this is important because we have to keep the lens since it's vertically progressing, we have to keep the two dialing holes in the upper half of the eye. And when we <coughs> uh, do the irrigation and aspiration of the anterior visco, anterior to the IOL, you can see that there's no rotation. Even while doing the retro IOL visco removal, you will notice that there is hardly any rotation. There's no rotation at all. It stays where you put it. You can dial it with Sinsky hook, but the once your Sinsky, Sinsky hook is out, it will stay exactly where it is. It's stable even while we nudge the IOL. And it remains stable even when the eyeball is nudged with two stick sobs. No matter how much force you do, Whatever nudging, whatever forceful nudging or gentle nudging, it will not move. It's, it's a rock solid rotational stability because of this special haptic design. And these two pictures taken apart a uh, month shows you a concrete-like uh, solid uh, stability. And at any size of the pupil, you can see that ratio of distribution of light for distance intermediate and near remains the same, so it is pupil independent. Uh, the typical refraction, this is very interesting. After the surgery, next day or day after, when you ref over refract the patient with anything from plus one to minus 3.5, the patient's vision will remain uh, same, six by six or six by nine. That gives you the ampl amplitude of uh, accommodation. And uh, the nearly flat curve on the DOF on the minus side gives you an indication. It gives us a confirmation that uh, this lens has a pseudo accommodation exactly mimicking the natural human lens of a teenager. And contrast sensitivity is, a, uh, is as good as a young adolescent me as measured on Pelly Robson chart. And the MTF function, which is an indicator of the quality of image and the quality of contrast. Uh, Autofocus Pro has 72% uh, MTF function. Monofocal lens, aspheric monofocal lens has a function of 80%. And all the multifocals do not go beyond 45%.
So uh, this is n working, I mean, giving the image quality which is nearly like a monofocal lens. Uh, the normal anatomical variations of size and shape of the pupil and position of the pupil doesn't make any difference. So al angle alpha or angle kappa has no importance. And there's no optical noise as it is in a diffractive ring, the IOL. Hence, it is uh, free from the neuroadaptation. As soon as you put it next day morning, the patient is reading 6, 6, N6 and computer by 6. Uh, beyond cataracts, it is also the best choice for surgical treatment of breast biopia, hyperopia, and high myopia, as well as for the closed angle glaucomas. Uh, out of more than 5,000 implanted by a group of 65 of us uh, in last uh, three years, not a single patient has complained of negative dyspotopsia because of its size. Even in a dilated pupil, you cannot see the edge uh, of the IOL. And uh, even in a traumatic madrasis like this, the IOL border cannot be seen. So it is, this is the reason why it is free from the negative dyspotopsia. And uh, because of its large size, this lens is an ideal choice for various types of natural hydrogenic or traumatic colobomas and for the mydriatic pupils uh, induced by acute naringal glaucoma or by trauma. It is also the best choice for kids because these children, they have their progressive myopia. They don't want to wear the bifocal glasses in the school. So the parents have to keep spending on autofoc um, on uh, progressive chashma, which is around 8,000 rupees. They have to spend at every six months or at every eight months. Whereas with uh, autofocus pro, even if they have to use the glasses, it will be only plain monofocal minus glasses, which they have to, but never bifocal, never uh, progressive. It has a very sharp uh, square edge double square edge ring, so the PCO rate is as low. Uh, this is 30 months post-op and you can see that the, uh, 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 the post capsule is very clean. This is the simulated vision of Autofocus Pro. So there's hardly any glare, any halo, so it can be implanted in night drivers also. This is the uh, box design. And all other IOLs are gems, but the Autofocus Pro, I would say, is the jewel of the crown. Uh, please visit mm. us uh, either at autofocuspro.in, mm. our website, and uh, it is launched in this conference, so you can visit our booth 109A uh, and learn more about Autofocus Pro. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you, I, Dr. Uh, Kakadia, uh, sir. You uh, are in many ways Leonardo da Vinci of Indian ophthalmology. <laughs> you keep on doing something new every time you come. I have used around 50 lenses and I can vouch for it. The presentation will come in the Hello. next conference. Thank you. Can I, yeah, yeah I, I would like to answer that question. Uh, can I, uh, yeah. so do I have a time yeah. to answer yeah. that? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> can I, can I? Yeah. Okay, so the first question is that uh, what happens if the patient looks up or down? Now the answer to this is that when the patient wants to read, the macula in the brain will find the finest point of focus. So the eye, if you carefully observe when the patient is reading, the eye moves about a degree up in order to bring the lower segment uh, uh, in a usable area. When the patient is looking at distance, when you are refracting for distance, the eyeball goes slightly down. So within a day, the patient learns how to adjust. I mean, it's, it's an unconscious learning of the mind how to adjust uh, to this. And out of more than 5,000, which has been implanted by 65 of us in last three years, not a single patient has complained that remove my lens. So you have to really try it. Use few lenses and you will realize that there's no lens in the world which is better than this lens. I can, 
I can guarantee you that there is no lens which is better than this lens. And this is not the sir, you, sir, you should give one lens to each person in this hall, sir, <laughs> for them to use. Now, now, the answer to this question is that this is a company which is formed by 65 ophthalmologists, investing ophthalmologists. So the company is owned by ophthalmologists, for ophthalmologists, by ophthalmologists. So if we start giving free samples, we will be losing our own money. We are not the business people. But I would strongly recommend that you purchase the IOL and I can guarantee you that you will not be dissatisfied. That's for sure. None of your patient will be dissatisfied. None of you will be dissatisfied. And the, and, and the price is 7,500 rupees for, for IOL. That is including GST. So the net price of an imported monofocal, for the net price of an imported monofocal, you get an Indian progressive multifocal with 7.5 millimeters horizontal optic, which cancels the negative dyscotoxia for, for sure. So what was the second question, sir? <laughs> pupil comes right, right. So when the pupil becomes small, the pupil will not go beyond one millimeter, no. not smaller than one millimeter, right? So we have tried this, putting pilocarpine 2%, pilocarpine 1% eye drops, and taking the retroillumination, taking the abrometry. And I can guarantee you that patient never loses the near vision, patient never loses the computer vision, patient never loses the distance vision. So sir, the depth of focus would increase when the pupils are increasing. So yeah. you're having an edo pupil dilated. Right. 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 Sir, Ramesh, you come in. Because he, he is, he, his is the brain and the GST, two people have made it happen. Central 0.9 millimeter has got all the three zones. So that will solve your problem. It has taken almost three years to come to this conclusion. No company will be able to produce this lens where 0.9 millimeter has got three zones. That is appreciated. Yeah. And the sir, best part is on optical bench when we test this lens, the modulation transfer function of this lens is very, very close to monofocal lens. In spite of that, it is a multifocal lens. With, with all multifocal, you never go beyond 45%. This is 70, 72%. And that too for near intermediate distance. If you do the MTF on a machine, for near intermediate distance, it maintains same almost 70% for all three visions. In a trifocal, I would say the near vision MTF is 14%. Distance with an MTF is around 25, 26%. And I'm uh, sorry, uh, intermediate. And the distance is around 40, 45%. So, I mean, trifocal is nothing compared to this. Even bifocal, multifocal is nothing compared to this. Once you, once you use four or five lenses, you will fall in love with this lens. And then with me and RC. <laughs> sir, sir, sir. I personally do seven patients a no, day. Sir. I have made three I observations. Do person no, no, seven patients. You ask him outside, please. Sir, so we'll, we, we still have three speakers, Dr. Boramani, yeah. Dr. Maurya, and Dr. Manik Nicholson. So we'll have discussion after I'll that. I'll take only, only one minute, because the purpose of my talk is that both of them are prolific FICO surgeons, so don't go with the impression that this multifocal or autofocal, or whatever multifocal and autofocus lenses are meant only for FICO surgery. It is not like that. You can use it in SICS, provided you learn what your Dr. Arthi has shown. If you're able to manage your uh, astigmatism well with the SICS incisions, you can put multifocal autofocus lenses with more confidence because now you know what is going to be your astigmatism. So all cases I do SICS, and I'm a small surgeon doing very few cases. So I'll show you the result of my 23 implants, which I have put after Diwali, all these autofocus lenses, which are non-serrated. So most of the patients have got 69 or 66 unaided vision. There was one patient with uh, six patients with 612 vision unaided. The near vision is excellent in all the cases. Only one patient had uh, little less near vision. Uh, one uh, one patient N9 and N12. Our chart, our optometrist measure only up to N6. Most of these patients must be going to N5, N4. We don't know. And this N12 patient was having ARMD. So near visually generally ex, uh, ex, uh, excellent and 
this lens is a forgiving type of lens. Even if you end up with some refractive error, the end result is very good. As Dr. Kakade said, there are no disport of CS, nothing. So you can happily implant this. I'm not going to show this video because uh, implanting through an injector might be a little difficult, for a, but for an SICS surgeon, just fold it little with the uh, forceps and implant. No, I think I don't know how much time is there. Uh, that's why. Anyway, uh, so, and I feel that mostly the multinationals will start copying this design in future. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, it's very fine, very fine. Yes, sir. Yeah. So may they may they make very slight variation and copy. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, next. Hello, next. So, Dr. Arvind is Associate Professor of Ophthalmology, oh, oh. Ames, Jodhpur. No? Uh, additional professor and head at Ames, B.B. Nagar, Hyderabad. Oh, Hyderabad. No. He was shifted from Jodhpur to B.B. Nagar, Hyderabad. Thank you, Arvind. Everyone, thank you, Sau sir and Buramani sir for giving me this opportunity. So my uh, talk is this SICS in supra hard cataract. So preoperative measures, the consent and prognosis is very important, and proper A and B scan, especially B scan is very important because we are not able to see the fundus. So we can't tell the prognosis ab uh, about the outcome after the surgery. So B scan is a must, proper dilatation. If it is not there, then we can opt for the B hacks or the Gupta's ring or the RS hooks that can be opted. And I do uh, SICS in the peribulbar block uh, with no to minimum pressure. And uh, I always prefer to put uh, the CMC eye gel so that there is no corneal abrasion. So while we are operating, so we have a very clear view in the anterior chamber. Incision size, 6 to 6.5 millimeter, frown shape most of the time, superior temporal. And now we have shifted to completely nasal side uh, incision. We are not no more using the bridal suture, not at all. And for the starting of the capsular axis, initial sharp neck is given, and then very gentle capsular axis using the cystitome, utrata, and micro capsular axis forceps, especially in the hardest of the cataract. And we are dealing with the mogagnion or the uh, these uh, milky white cortex is there, so I prefer uh, micro capsular axis forcep. And the size is between 5.5 to 6 millimeter, and hydro procedure are very gentle. Regarding the nucleus management, uh, this anterior chamber prolapse using one or two Sinsky's hook by tumbling technique, and after prolapse, 2% HPMC towards the endothelia, this I prefer. And this nucleus can be managed using the visco expression, irrigating wire vectors or phaco fracture. And snare, and now pre-chopper is available, uh, developed by Dr. Khan. It's a very good choice, but it, uh, it has a very steep learning curve. So that we have to take care. And uh, now we are not even using the visco for the, this endo expression. We are using the BSS only. And it is a very good result while preserving the endothelia. Only 5%, we have done 53 cases. Our sample size is around 300. So very soon we'll, we would like to presents uh, some, some place. So uh, this endothelial loss is only f between five to seven percent. Uh, so not too much pressure on the anterior lip and avoiding any endothelial touch. Side port, I prefer because it keeps the anterior chamber deep and the sub-incisional cortex, we can remove it by using the side port. And the uh, uh, IOL can be any choice, PMMA or foldable. And viscoelastic removal, it needs to be diligently and patiently done to avoid any IOP surge in the post-operative period. And sealing of the side port and air bubble uh, to maintain the anterior chamber. So it's a, these are a few videos. So very minimum cautery I prefer. As told by other speaker also, minimum cautery. And a frown incision. That is 1.75 to 2.25 millimeter away from the limbus. And uh, the size is six millimeter. 
then using the this crescent, this tunnel is extended in a rectangular shape. So it can accommodate uh, the hard and the large nucleus, 2% over the cornea. And now it's a morganian cataract, so th there's this milky white cortex is coming out and we have developed under the leadership of Dr. Rainder Prasad, this uh, sweeping needle microcapsulotomy technique and uh, we have won the first prize in the, the just recently happened American Society of Cataract Surgery. So you can uh, go through that. It's available on YouTube. So now there is no more cortex left. So we'll start with the rexis part. It's still there. So for better control, in such cases, I prefer Uttarata or uh, this microcapsular axis forcep to have a better control and we can hold it again and again after one or two clock, uh, clock hour of capsular axis. This is how it is completed. It's around 5.5 millimeter, but the nucleus is large. So it's completed. Now prolapse into the anterior chamber using the Sinsky hook. This is how the stucking of the Sinsky hook and bringing it out, out of the capsular axis margin. You can see uh, it is now a slit. So it can, uh, it can accommodate up to five to, uh, this 5.5 millimeter size can accommodate up to eight to nine millimeter of large nucleus because it's now uh, like a slit. And if the anterior chamber is shallow, then I prefer it to be parallel to the RS plane. But here it was deep, so it was vertical, and now removal from the anterior chamber using the wire vectors. So this is how, avoiding any contact with the IRS, very gently, and then removal of the remaining cortical matter and placement of foldable iron. So we are implanting even trifocal uh, using the SICS taking care of the uh, steeper axis in the back. This trailing haptic is stuck, so it can happen. So with the help of the other instrument, Sinsky hook, now it is out and in the back. This again, uh, <coughs> supra hard cataract. Using the BSS only, it's been prolapsed. Now you can see the anterior chamber is shallow with hazy cornea. So all these steps were parallel to the RS plane, avoiding any endothelia touch. This is visco expression of the nucleus. Hello, yes, sir. This is the last yes, case. Sir, <coughs> so gentle hydro procedures. Prolapse into the anterior chamber. You can see the pigmentation over the this anterior nucleus. And now, 2% towards the endothelia and removal using the visco expression. And if the suture is required, we are preferring equidistant, a figure of eight suture. The knot is in the tunnel only. So th those kind of suture we are preferring. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, next. Next. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Maurya, sir, for a very extensive videos. Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah, we are short of time and we still have two more speakers. I would request Dr. Manik Nicholson, who has been the one of the backbones of our SICS training programs, to present the magic of AC maintainer and then uh, we couldn't hear Dr. Nivian, uh, his SICS with secondary IOL options for five minutes. So let's hope we have the time and we are able to do that too. You please be ready, Dr. Nivian. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Sawi, sir, for this opportunity and Dr. Boramani for all the help with the presentation. So today, after all of these videos, towards the end of the session, I'll be talking on a very simple topic. Uh, I'll be talking about the versatility of the anterior chamber maintainer, a very uh, small but easy instrument. 
in small incision cataract surgery. So there are various techniques to skin a cat, but today we'll be d uh, discussing a little bit about the Blumenthal technique, which was popularized by Dr. Michael Blumenthal. So there are various types of anterior chamber maintainers available in the market. I don't think it's important which one you choose to use. More important is the technique of insertion. Uh, it's usually made with a uh, 19 gauge MDR blade pointed towards six o'clock position. One must ensure that the tunnel is not too long or too short. Long tunnels cause a little bit of stromal hydration, making vis visualization difficult, and short tunnels cause the AC maintainer to repeatedly slip out. Uh, what mus one must ensure is that the AC maintainer is primed before insertion. A screwing movement is used to insert it into the anterior chamber, and then it's turned bevel down to face the anterior lens capsule. So we will be, in short, discussing each of these steps in uh, the role of the anterior chamber maintainer in each of them. So uh, although most of us use viscoelastic to create the rexus, it is possible to do it under the anterior chamber maintainer. One advantage is that you don't have to repeatedly keep injecting viscoelastic into the anterior chamber. The only problem which you'll see occurs here when you approach the anterior, where approach the maintainer where the flap tends to flutter a bit. But if you keep it flat on the anterior capsule and uh, uh, ensure that it stays flat, uh, it's quite easy to complete and get a good size rexus. Uh, tunnel creation is also, uh, what I do usually is I do the rexus and then I make the tunnel. So I already have one side port created and through that sometimes visco tends to escape out. But if you keep the anterior chamber on while creating a tunnel, you get a good depth of the tunnel and um, uh, the globe does not tend to soften during uh, tunnel creation. This is an animation showing the same. There's a lot of, po the, the anterior chamber maintainer keeps the pressure within the eye positive. And you don't have a lack, lack scleral wall, and therefore tunnel creation is quite easy while keeping the anterior chamber on. So next is nucleus delivery. What Dr. Michael Blumenthal described was uh, originally uh, delivering the nucleus using an iris repositor. This is what is shown in the first video. Um, by repeatedly pressing the posterior lip of the uh, wound with an iris repositor, one can easily deliver a nucleus. Um, you will also see that there's some amount of bleeding from this wound. However, because the fluid is flowing from inside to out, there is no egress of blood back into the anterior chamber. Um, you can also replace the iris repositor with a sheet slide, which is not what we normally use just because of uh, uh, cost. But one can also use a McPherson's now, which is what I do. Uh, I use a McPherson's to press on the posterior lip of the wound and repeatedly pressing can deliver even hard brunescent cataracts. So the advantages of using it is that it provides a one-way flow. It acts as a tamponade in case of bleeding. Uh, there's low turbulence and low flow, therefore less discharge of prostaglandins, which results in less post-operative inflammation and uh, intraocular pressure spikes post-operatively. Uh, there was a large study done in a large institute in South India, which compared blue menthol SICS with ECC and FACO, and they found that the percentage reduction of endothelial cell loss was in fact the least with blue menthol SICS. So this leaves us with cortex wash and aisle insertion. Cortex wash is particular, it's particularly useful to use a uh, AC maintainer for this step because the intraocular pressure is maintained. And therefore, there are less chances of an expulsive hemorrhage. The pupil stays dilated and the bag stays distended, which makes it safer to perform eye under uh, an AC maintainer. Aisle insertion requires a bit of a learning curve, at least it did requ require for me, because the positive pressure within the anterior chamber causes the aisle to repeatedly slip out. But once you get a good hold of the aisle and dial it into the AC, it's actually quite a quick method to uh, place the aisle in the bag, because you don't require to do any uh, a visco wash at the end of the surgery. Um, this is a particularly useful uh, tool, in especially in cases of complications. You can see that uh, uh, a rent was noted at the time of aisle placement in the bag, and the surgeon has very adeptly and dexterously sort of dialed the uh, aisle back into the sulcus. At no time the anterior chamber maintainer was turned off. This helped pressurize the anterior chamber and pr uh, helped prevent the tear from extending. So there are various variations which have been described in literature of the anterior chamber maintainer. You can also inject viscoelastic, that is what some surgeons do. And what has now recently been described in literature is the use of a troca cannula to re replace the anterior chamber maintainer as well. So uh, some of the pitfalls of visco which I thought I would list here were that it does, uh, it is it is more costly than an anterior chamber maintainer. It uh, can result in post-operative IOP spikes. Uh, there have been known cases of TAS induced by viscoelastics, endotoxin contamination. And one of, the anterior, uh, one of the advantages of the ACM is that you can continuously irrigate medications such as adrenaline and antibiotics via the AC maintainer. So uh, just in conclusion, the anterior chamber maintainer has a lot of advantages as compared to the others, but no one technique is best. Whatever works best in your hands is what you should do. And there's still so many newer techniques which are coming up under the ISM SICS banner, and it would be useful for an SICS surgeon to be adept at all of them. Thank you so much.
Thank you, sir. So my topic is going to be SIS with all the secondary I/O options. So so far they've seen all the different types of how SIS was done. So, yeah. So I think uh, the previous speaker's last slide was my first uh, thing that I grew up uh, doing a lot of SICS and enjoying the whole surgery and then changed to FACO and then became a VR surgeon. Now I think the entire SIC has been reinvented by this group of MICS thing and it's such a joy to be a part of them and learn so much and as ma'am said, there's so much to learn. That's why I'm not going to describe the SICS part because the way they do the incisions have changed, how they do it, two millimeters and all the premium eyeballs. So once the SICS are done, this was actually a subdilated hard cataract. So first itself we had actually planned to remove the entire cataract in total and place a claw lens. So claw lens is one of the best options when you do SICS and since we are a training center also we get a lot of patients with whole bag removals and very bad cataracts. So this particular case I'm going to show you a retropupillary claw lens. Because it was a planned surgery, I don't have this slit lamp because the entire nucleus was dislocated. I actually went ahead and fixed the trocar. But it's not necessary, you can also use the AC maintainer. And now I'm entering into the anterior uh, chamber with the keratome. You can see the entire lens actually bulging out, so there are no zonules, only superiorly there are like two clockers or zonules actually attached and hanging. You will see that when I'm delivering the nucleus. So I can see that there's no nucleus, because if you had some zonular support, there would be some traction there. So except for the superior part, the entire uh, nucleus is almost just going to fall. So either you have a complication of a whole bag removal or if it is a planned surgery. So once you have an aphakia, a good vitrectomy is a key for any secondary IO, uh, no matter what type of secondary IO you're going to implant. And I always prefer to stain the vitreous with tricot. Because two advantages, one you can see the vitreous very clearly and the second thing is some amount of the tricot crystals that actually go back uh, prevents the post-operative CME isn't it. So in two ways it's useful, so always don't, never hesitate to stain the vitreous and the initially I used the main port because I had some of the bag remnants that was there to clear but always they say use the side port because you can have it formed so that there's no more prolapse of the vitreous. So after a good anterior vitrectomy, so we're going to go uh, place the iris claw lenses. So these retropupillary eyelids claw lenses are very, very easy to use. The only trick here is I always take my second hand inside first where I'm going to clip and I mark the area and then take the lens. So this makes it easier for me so that I avoid searching that area. See my second hand instrument is already there where I'm going to clip and then I lift up the hand which holds the IOL and the left hand pushes down. Because sometimes what happens is when we are actually clipping the lens, the other hand tends to move down. So that is why we say we're not able to clip it. So the simple trick is you hold it with those, and the second thing is those forceps you see, you need to have some broad forceps. So the normal IOL forceps, when you hold it very hard, it slips the lenses. So that is another reason we find it hard to clip. So any of the shepherd forceps or the iris claw forceps that has this broad end, so you can use that. So push it upwards, and then just a small thing, you can see a dimple in this thing. So iris claw lenses are good. If you do it in the mid periphery, you can get these round oval pupils. And only if you come very anterior, you get those cat eye pupils or you go very posteriorly, you might have some bleeding. So, and you get good amount of dilatation to see the fundus. So iris claw lenses is one of the first options that we have for any of these aphakic patients. And then moving on to the second thing, SIC is another thing is even though you have a large rent where in, uh, in FACO you cannot keep unless you have a three piece lenses. So this was another case of an SIC we have planned it in second, as a secondary procedure. Since it was a secondary procedure is why I'm doing a pasplana vitrectomy because it, uh, in these types of large lenses, it prevents more vitreous prolapse. If you have a small rupture, you can always do the anterior approach, that is the best. But since you can see here, the anterior rim is there. So rigid lens in the sulcus is one of the best options. And as far as you make sure there is no vitreous in the wounds, make sure you swipe and see the entire anterior capsular margin so that you are sure that the entire margin is there. So once it happens, what I'm saying is even though if it is a large rent, these rigid lenses in the sulcus are very, very stable and it can be done. So once you I didn't check it, viscoelastic, oh, sorry, this filling viscoelastic also, don't fill it in the anterior chamber. You can fill it between the gap between the anterior capsular margin and the iris. So what that does is it creates some space for you to put the lens inside between the iris and this thing. And then the, make sure that the leading haptic, that is the haptic, the make sure that the leading haptic goes inside. You're very sure you're seeing the margins and the leading haptic goes inside. I usually do the two-step technique where I just stop uh, this thing and I go through the side port and then the optic haptic junction, so actually take it and curve it along the iris margin. And then no more manipulations, I just use a Simco cannula to actually aspirate some of the, the remaining uh, uh, with, uh, visco whatever is used and I always let in an air bubble. 
So thank you. And this is a new invention of my lens called the CMT flex lens. So this has a special T-shaped haptic because initially if you ask me the last option is instead of doing a sutured lenses in, SF, uh, in SACS cases. So these lenses have these uh, specialized T-shaped haptics. So you do a sclerostomy and you pull out this uh, haptics outside. The T opens up and that prevents the lens from falling back. So this is also another option where you have an essay this complication you can see. I'm just running it for the pass of time. So holding the T junction through the sclerostomy and then gently bringing it out. Once you bring it out, the T opens up and then now shifting to the other side, holding the head of it and bring it out. So once that is there, you don't know tucking, no suturing, no gluing because uh, this lens just stays there with those haptics outside. That's the entire design of these lenses. So thank you once again, the entire team, MICS, and special thanks to Amulya Sahu, sir, for always inspiring and motivating us. And thank you. That's thank what you. I said. It's like reinventing the whole journey of SACS, and nice thank to you. see the full. Yeah, thank yeah. you, sir. The last one is a hydrophilic material. It's a single piece hydrophilic lens. Thank you. How much you. Uh, 1.5 millimeters away from the limbus, the overall size of the lens is 14. So as of now, we can do it for normal eyes. So, but if you have these large eyeballs or something, uh, right now uh, we don't have that. But if it's a smaller eyeball, we can do the sclerostomy a little far away, up to two millimeters maybe. Okay, sorry. Uh, what size? Uh, 23 gauge. Okay. So that's uh, it's like sutureless and. So I thank all the speakers and audience for having their patience. They have given this time a small hall, and uh, next time it will be bigger. Thank you. But within a small time, we can cover all the entire gamut of uh, SICs, including complications.